All right, good morning, everybody. Everybody had a good weekend, enjoyed the Super Bowl. How many people were rooting for the team that won? How many people were rooting for the team that didn't win? Okay, but how many people didn't care? All right. <laughs> well, at least it was like somewhat, a somewhat entertaining game. Okay, so today we're going to talk about CPU multiplexing. I'm going to try to give you guys a historical perspective for why we do this. So we'll talk about some old systems that did not multiplex the CPU, and then we'll start to talk about um, relationships between the CPU and other components that make CPU multiplexing important and, and potentially useful. And then we're going to talk about the actual mechanism that the operating system uses to both create the illusion of concurrency, so the illusion that multiple things could actually be happening on a system when there's really physically only one thing or four things or eight things that could be happening. So expanding the notion of concurrency past the limits of the actual physical hardware. And then we're also going to talk about um, just the mechanics of, of saving thread state and moving things back and forth on and off the CPU. OK, so we're going to, the grading for the code reading question should start today. I'm going to give the TA's instructions after class, but uh, the online grading is, is ready, so you guys should start to see. Um, some of you might have already seen some, some grades come back, because I was fooling around with it, like you. Um, just like two questions, just for fun. Um, but So we're going to start grading today, and, and people who have submitted answers should start to see our marks come back. And then you will have, for the code reading questions, one more chance to submit answers before we uh, finalize your scores and, and show you the correct answers. So that's how things are going to work. And hopefully everything is self-explanatory, but please uh, let us know if it's not or if it's, or if it's confusing in any way. Um, I also put up a handout. I didn't send out email because it was late Friday night, but I put a handout up on uh, getting a clip set up for OS 161, which might be something that some of you guys want to do. Uh, it's definitely uh, not too difficult to get it set up to browse and build uh, OS 161 kernels. Uh, the debugging support is a little, is a little more grokky. Uh, I've really never used Eclipse as a debugger, but I was a little disappointed in it. But I don't know what the problem is. Maybe somebody out there who's a big Eclipse hacker can fix it for us. But for now, it's just a little bit slow. So I don't know what to do about that. But it, it does work, kind of. So um, anyway, go follow the handout and, and, and see how far you go. All right, so last week we talked uh, quite a bit about uh, some of the low-level CPU mechanisms like uh, CPU privilege that allow the kernel to do its job and, and the reason that we privilege the kernel. We talked about ways that the kernel gets control of the system, specifically uh, interrupts generated by either hardware or software, and then exceptions. So cases where the operating system will begin to run uh, either because something interesting happened to hardware that needs, uh, that needs to be dealt with, or the software did something interesting, or the software did something wrong. Okay? Um, so any questions about the material that we covered, covered last week? We'll do a slightly longer review today just to get everybody back up to speed. Any questions about last week's material? OK. So why does the operating system need special privileges, Manish? Okay, th we're getting close to a correct answer. Tam. Uh, to, divide to divide the resources, right? So the applications are trusting the operating system to divide the resources in an efficient way. And then once I've divided the resources, what else do I have to do? Yeah, look. Enforce those divisions, right? So, uh oh. <sighs> Sorry, that's my fault. Go away. Right, to divide the resources and enforce those divisions. So let's see, uh, Sarah, true or false, operating systems need privileges to create abstractions for programs to use. False, right? And there's several pieces of evidence to the contrary, OK? So how does the processor start? How does the, what, what features of the processor exist to allow the kernel to gain these special privileges? Is it Masakazu? What is the processor? What feature does the processor provide that allows the kernel to do this? You don't, you don't remember? Yeah, Sean. Uh, 
kernel mode, right? Kernel or privileged mode, which gives the kernel special powers on the processor itself and also some other special powers on the machine, potentially a different view of memory, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, good. Um, what happens when an interrupt is triggered? An interrupt or an exception will cause what to happen? Three things. Tao, give me one of them. It enters privileged mode, yeah. What's your name? Chicker. So, okay, they're getting, that's, that's a vague beginning of an answer. Daniel. Record state necessary to process whatever happened in Jeremy. It jumps to a specific place, what we call the interrupt service routine, and begins to execute instructions at that memory address, right? What causes hardware interrupts? Bethany, give me one thing. Yeah, yeah, like a disk write finished. What else? Something else. Andrew. Network packet, Network packet arrived. Yeah. Angel. Okay, okay. I know. Device, something happened. Device needs some sort of attention, right? So disk read completed, network packet showed up. And today we'll get to timers and why we have timers and, and one of the main uses for timers on the system. But timers also fire regularly, causing the CPU to enter the interrupt service routine. All right. Software interrupts. Give me some examples of software interrupts. Yeah. Nope. Software interrupts. We'll come back to that answer. Yeah. Fork. Fork. Yeah. So this is how user applications get, get the kernel to run when they need something to happen. Right? So we have this mechanism that allows the kernel to run. And that mechanism is also used by user applications to get the kernel to run to do something for them. Right? And we call this system calls. Right? So fork, exec, wait, things like this. Right? These are all examples of cases in which a user application will trigger the kernel intentionally and cause it to run. Okay? Software exceptions. Yeah. So what, what, what is a software exception? Right? Distinguish it from an interrupt. Let's do that first. Yeah. Remo. Yeah, so a, a software exception, and again, the, the big way you can remember this is processes expect a, a system call to happen, right? Processes set up a system call and initiate the system call themselves, right? So they are not surprised that the kernel will begin to run. A software exception, on the other hand, is normally a case where the application would not have expected the kernel to start running at that point. Jeremy, yeah. Yeah, and, and essentially a good way of thinking about this is software exceptions or CPU exceptions happen when the CPU cannot continue to execute instructions without some sort of help, right? And, and what, what could cause something like this? Yeah. Divide by zero, right? So example of a software exception, divide by zero. I don't know what to do, right? I don't know what to return. There's no way to return a value for this, so I'm going to ask the, um, the kernel for help. Jeremy, something else. Yeah, a null pointer exception would be an example of this, and, and we'll get back to that when we do memory management. But the user application has tried to use a memory address that I don't know, I don't know where it should go, right? It's given me a memory address, and it said to store something there, to load something there, and I don't know where that memory should be. Right? Or another example is attempt to use an instruction that should only be able to be used in privilege. All right. Why would the operating system, we talked about masking interrupts, right? And uh, you can see, uh, you know, and, and I think this week in recitation, you guys will walk through some of the interrupt handling code with Aditya, and you guys will see certain places where the, um, your OS161 kernel manipulates the processor, um, the processor interrupt mask, right? Um, but why would, why would the operating system want to ignore certain interrupts in certain cases? No hand raisers. I'm going to go with Greg. Doesn't remember. Doesn't remember. Sam, do you remember? If, uh, you know, if you just interrupt that kind of low priority, it doesn't want to uh, give resources to the higher priority operation. Sure. So the masking allows me to establish priorities between hardware devices, right? 
And actually today, when we get back to talking about concurrency and scheduling and the mechanisms behind scheduling, we, we could come back to this and we could talk about a specific example where while I'm handling a certain type of interrupt, I definitely do not want to handle another interrupt of that same type, it turns out, in this particular case. So how does the operating system, so I've got these interrupt handlers, right? And the interrupt handlers are what, one, are, uh, are what run when something happens on the machine that needs to be dealt with by the kernel, right? But those interrupt handlers just live in memory, and so applications can overwrite them, right? And that would allow them to take control of the system and do things that they shouldn't be able to do. And how do I prevent that? Frank. I'm not sure. What about, what's your name? Vinay. Vinay. Uh, they're not allowed to modify the particular memory location where the uh, ID is stored. Right. So I put, you know, and, and this is something that the, the CPU also helps me with, right? But these are located in areas of memory that are protected from access by user applications, right? So the code that lives at this particular memory address is not code that a user application could modify. What would happen if it tried to overwrite the interrupt handle? That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, it would, cause a, it would actually cause a page fault, right? It would cause a page fault. The CPU would say, uh, you know, either I don't think that this application is supposed to be able to modify this memory, or I don't know where this memory address is supposed to be, and the kernel would notice what was happening, and it would kill that, that process, right? It would say, bad process. You're definitely not allowed to, to take control away from me, right? I mean, the, the kernel is kind of a you know, a, a, a domineering tyrant of the system, right? Any challenges to its authority are met with swift and certain retribution. That is, if your kernel works properly. If it doesn't, then, <laughs> then you have more anarchy and then things go bad, okay? Um, you guys should be designing extremely dictatorial, you know, cruel kernels in this class, right? Don't allow user processes to get away with stuff, right? Don't think the kernel's being nice if you let the user processes write over random parts of memory, okay? Um, all right, questions about this stuff. This was last week in four slides, five slides. Maybe. All right, so let me, let me take you back to sort of the dawn of time. Uh, many of you guys, uh, well, I shouldn't say many, probably all of you guys, including me, weren't, weren't alive back when some of these things were happening. Um, so, you know, in, until quite recently, you know, one of the limitations, we talked about this, right? The limit, we talked about what are the limitations of the CPU that the operating system is trying to, to work around, right? What are the problems with the CPU that we're going to create abstractions to try, to try to fix, right? Or to try to address. And historically, you know, you had systems, and this was true, I'm trying to, it'd be a good question to figure out. I wonder if anybody can look this up for me. You know, the, the first emergence into the mainstream consumer market of multi-core, multi-processor systems. I think when my, when my brother was starting college, so this would have been in like early 2000s, his roommate had a dual processor machine. And that was kind of like a big deal. Um, yeah, Jeremy. I remember the, the Pentium 2 or 3 used to have a, a, a card that you could put, that you could put, you put it into the, the, the processor slot. And uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, there were these like gawky ways of supporting this, right? So, like some of the some of the motherboards maybe didn't have sockets for two, so you know you had to you had to do have some workaround. But the funny thing about my brother's roommate's computer, I remember, was that he had he had been sold this computer by Dell, but they had sold him a version of Windows that only supported one processor, and it took him a while to figure this out, right? But there were two processors inside the box, and he had probably paid a fair amount for those two processors, but only one of them was actually being turned on. Um, and used. So that was a little disappointing when he found that out. Um, so, so recently we've seen all this move toward multi-core systems. I mean, how many people have a, how many people have a multi-core phone? Anybody? Okay, so why? Why have we, you know, what, what happened? We had these um, CPUs and they were great and they were getting faster and faster and faster. I had Moore's Law and, and things were going up up into the right fairly quickly. And now, suddenly, we've, we've, we have these two core, four core, eight core processors. Why did we start going in that direction? Yeah, Webley. Well, the processing power caused a lot of heat to be Well, yeah, it's a little more complicated than that. So there, there have, so there have been the, these thermal design problems, right? Um, and and partly, partly these also emerged because, 
of leakage current and some sort of transistor physics issues and things like this. But, but yeah, I mean, that's not a bad answer. So after years and years and years of going faster and faster and faster, are you, I mean, how many people remember these old Pentium 4 processors, right? I mean, you know, they, 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 were, they were up to like, what, three and a half gigs, like four gigs? I mean, they were going fast, right? Does anyone remember what the heat sinks for those things look like? They were, yeah, they were these like, they were like a rocket launcher, you know? They were a foot tall. <laughs> and, and those things got really, 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 really hot. Um, so to some degree, what we started to do is, is started to spread out, right? So we started to trade off uh, temperature, right, and speed for area. So now we have, and, and it's an interesting you know, design point, right? Because for, for a long time, concurrency was only an illusion that was provided by the CPU, right? And now it is actually a reality that started to uh, be embodied by the, the architectures themselves, right? But, but again, even if you have a four core phone or an eight core laptop or whatever, what is still true about the relationship between processes and cores? I've got more processes than, uh, you know, I have more cores than I have tasks to be run, right? In fact, if you have a reasonably, uh, if you're like me and, and you take and you abuse Firefox tabs, you probably have more tabs, more threads in Firefox, right? Or whatever the new browser is that all the cool kids are using. But I'm still using Firefox because I'm old and crufty. Um, you have more cores in Firefox than you have tasks, than, sorry, more tasks in Firefox than you have cores on your system, right? So even if all your system did was run Firefox or, or Chrome or whatever, it would still, you would still need some illusion of concurrency provided by the operating system to do this, right? So, so one, one of the things we're going to keep coming back to throughout uh, this semester as we work our way sort of uh, through the hardware components of the system is looking at the relationship between the properties of these components, how that relationship has changed over time. And to some degree, those ratios between different things have driven a lot of operating system design, right? And a lot of architectural design as well, right? So if you had to use one word to compare the CPU to every other part of the system, what would it be? Faster. Way faster, right? It's just, it's not even in the, in the right ballpark, right? So let's see. So it's way faster than memory, OK? So um, depending on which level of, of in the cache memory you're hitting, right? So now you have these architectures that have like three levels of either on-chip L1 cache or near chip L2, L3 before you actually have to go all the way to main memory, right? But going out to main memory can stall the processor for how long? Anybody, anybody know? Expressed in like number of, of cycles. So how many, how many cycles do you think it takes to, uh, to access a register on the CPU? Five? Anyone want to go lower? Like, none, right? I mean, registers are, are, are usually immediate operands to things like adds and subtracts, right? So an add will be you know, a, a two-cycle instruction that'll take its operands from registers and put its, its uh, result into another register, right? So registers are just like there, right? But then main memory, right? Anyone want to venture a guess? Cycles for main memory. A couple hundred. A couple hundred cycles, right? is, is not, not a bad uh, rule of thumb. And it could, could be longer depending on where in the memory it is and whether or not it's cached somewhere or whatever. So, so yeah, so when your processor executes a load or store, it will potentially have to wait hundreds of cycles for the result of that to be available, right? So it says load an address from main, that turns out to be in main memory and put it into this register. And I might have to sit there for hundreds of instructions waiting for this to complete, right? So this is not a problem that's normally addressed by the operating system, right? This is, you know, how many people have taken some sort of computer architecture class? OK, great. So you guys know about, you know, auto order execution and multi-stage pipelining and all sorts of things, right? So this, this is typically something that is addressed by the CPU itself, right? So CPUs today have all these clever features that try to hide the latency associated with reads and writes from memory. Right? And they do this in very clever ways. But this is not something that the operating system gets involved with. Right? And to some degree, it's because it just happens on time scales that are too fast. Right? So, um, you know, so, so, for, so what, what could you do here? Right? What could, let's say you wanted to get the operating system involved. Uh, what, what could you do to try to solve this problem by, by, by having the operating system run? Yes? 
Anyone want to take a guess? So I have some, I have a thread running and it's been running some, some sort of computation and now it wants to write, the, or it wants to write or read a result from memory, right? So it's going to do that. And then what, what could I do? Yeah. Yeah, I could switch in another thread, right? I could, you know, switch out that thread and I could start up something on the CPU. And then how long would I have taken to do that? Varun. How long do you think it takes to execute a contact switch? Well, let's, let's express it in terms of cycles. Yeah, Jeremy. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, the, the short answer is it's way, way longer, right? I don't have, if I have 100 cycles, I do not, I don't even have time to get into the operating system just to, before that, read, that memory read is going to be done, right? So it's just too fast, right? It's too fast for the operating system to react. We start to talk about things like I.O., right? If I'm going out and I have to write something to disk, well, that, ta that might take like days, right? So I've got plenty of time to like leisurely make my way into the operating system and choose another thread to run. But these memory access latencies are way too fast, right? And in fact, I'll show you today some of the context switching code from OS 161, and it's hundreds of instructions, right? So it's like, you know, again, the, the, the memory, memory is slow compared with, you know, the immediate instructions on the processor, but it's fast compared with context switching. Right, so this is just a you know, demonstration of why we can't involve the OS in this process. It's too slow. Okay. All right. And, and like I said, the CPU is way, way, way faster than disk. Right. So this is like one of these. Um, do they have one of those in Buffalo? I know they have one in Boston where it's like a, it's like a scale model of the solar system where the sun is placed at like the Museum of Science and then the planets are out like Pluto's out in the suburbs somewhere, right? Like they, they do a mock-up where they, they, try, they keep the, they, they, I mean, it's not, obviously the distances aren't the same, but the distances are in scale, right? So you can see like how big the solar system it is and how much space there is. So the disks are like out in the suburbs, right? Like, you know, maybe memories is like Mercury, you know, orbiting kind of close to the sun, but the disks are like way, way, way out there, right? So, so, and this is addressed by the operating system, and we'll see how, uh, you know, today and, and, and later in the class, right? And then the, the final limitation of the system is you, right? Like, human processing and, and, and conceptual delays, right? And this is something that people usually don't think about when they think about things that the CPU and the operating system are trying to work around, but one of the big ones is you. Like, you are a slow, like, you are a very sophisticated processing uh, machine, if you want to think about yourself that way, right? But you are also slow, like slow, slow, slow. Um, and so while you're sitting around waiting to figure out what to do, the operating system has plenty of time to, to work on other things, right? And, and to some degree, some of these illusions of concurrency emerge because of your limitations, right? Not, not just the operating system, okay? It's important to keep in mind. So when I was, when I was preparing these slides, I, I went up and looked um, tried to find some imitations. I just was curious about this, you know, human perceptual limitations. Like, what are, what are some ballpark figures for uh, how delays in particular, delays that people will notice, right? And what I found out is that there's this rule of thumb, which is, you know, 15 milliseconds um, as, is a latency that once you start to get slower than that, people will start to notice, right? So if you think about, um, you know, 25 Apparently, in order to, for people to perceive video as smooth, it has to be at least 25 frames per second, right? So that's now a 40 millisecond uh, delay between frames. Um, for the old telephone systems, apparently they had this 100 millisecond delay, right? which is actually pretty long. Right? But what they found is that if you start to delay, you know, how many people have ever called a foreign country where there's like some pretty serious delay on the line? Right? Like your signal is being like, bounced up to a satellite and like off the moon and you know, coming, coming down on the other side of the world. So, um, and, and, you, and you guys know that at some point when that delay gets long enough, regular patterns of speech start to, to, start to fail, right? Because like you're used to being waiting for a certain period of time based on face-to-face -face conversations with other human beings that are right there. And then, you know, once it, once it starts to get long enough, it starts to become difficult to have a, a fluid conversation, right? So let's, so let's express these delays, right? to a one gigahertz processor, right? 
you know, 15 milliseconds is like 15 million clock cycles, right? And that's the shortest delay on this slide. So this gives you an idea of how slow you are, right, compared with your computer, right? I mean, your computer can potentially do like 15 million or, you know, whatever, 7.5 million instructions it can run while it's waiting for you to notice that it hasn't done anything for a little while, right? Okay. So I think this is like some, I think if I didn't include this, the, these next couple slides in the class, there was like some committee on operating systems instruction that would come here to campus and like march me away, right? So bear, bear with me because I think this is, this is just obligatory material that everybody has to, everyone has to learn. So um, again, so, so back, back in, you know, at the dawn of time, right, um, we, we didn't have, we didn't really have modern operating systems because we didn't have modern computers. We had these uh, fairly complex uh, machines that really ended up kind of doing one thing at a time, right? They were set up to perform a particular calculation. They ran that calculation. They produced a result. And then they were reconfigured to do something else, right? How, how, like, what's the, what do you guys think is the best analog for this type of device today? Jeff, you probably have one. Maybe you don't have one. Maybe you just have one on your phone now. Maybe when you grew up, you had one. Jeremy, I'm ignoring you. What's the best analog to this kind of device? Yeah. A calculator, right? I mean, these, how many people had a programmable calculator when they were in high school? I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, these were essentially, you know, sort of pretty sophisticated programmable calculators. That's, that's what they were. And there were uh, teams of, of, you know, dorky, dorky white guys, like those dudes, um, whose job it was to program, which really involved just like reconfiguring, you know, pulling out some wires and pushing in other wires, right? I mean, it, it's funny, because now that I look at this, I feel like this, this looks a lot like the telephone, the job that telephone switching operators used to do, right? And, and I think those jobs were primarily done by women. Apparently, this is a more sophisticated version of telephone switching, which can be done by men. Um, but anyway, I mean, it looks, it, looks pretty, it looks pretty similar to me. So, you know, they sat there and they pulled out wires and pushed them in other places. And then eventually they had the computer set up to run some ca calculation and then it would sit there worrying and, and clanking for a couple of days and then some number would come out, right? Um, and, you know, and essentially, to the degree that there, I mean, these computers, there, was, there, there were barely even what we would think of as modern programming languages, but to the degree that there was with some of these early systems that were not designed to support multiple users or even multiple processes, right? So multi-programming and supporting multi-users are things that we can talk about in different ways, right? But these things weren't, like this wasn't, th this just w didn't resemble a computer that you guys grew up with, right? You guys, you guys wouldn't, wouldn't really know what to do with this. Um, and so, you know, the, and, and but when people started to try to reuse pieces of their computation, right? When we started to see the emergence of, of languages and other toolkits to, pr to program and use these systems, it was really just all abstraction, right? Because there was no multiplexing. These things did one thing at a time, right? Um, so, and at some point, you know, these, these computer systems got powerful enough that they weren't just toys for, uh, for geeks to play with anymore, right? And people wanted to do things with them. And there were, there were people who kind of were out there and, and, and okay, these, these graphics are stupid, right? Like someone didn't want to use Firefox on the <laughs> on the Mark One, right? Um, but but you you see you see my point, right? So people lined up with their job, right? And and they submitted the job, and the job ran on the computer, and then you picked up the job later. This was sort of punch card computing, right? How many people know someone who ever programmed on a punch card, right? Or or heard about this? I thought so. This is this is I mean. You know, you kind of starts to sound like the uphill to school both ways sort of type story, but you guys should should listen to those people and respect their their experience with computing because it's because you guys have it pretty good compared with them. Um, so so what we had, but really what we had here was this idea of, of what's called batch scheduling, right? And we'll talk a little bit about batch scheduling in a few slides, I think, and, and we'll think about think about it as in relation to what we used what we do now, right? But this was batch schedule, and the computer did one thing at a time, right? And, and at some point, we know, again, we started to see the rise of sort of more interactive type of applications. And, and now you really had, for the first time, I, I would argue, real computer multiplexing, right? Because you had multiple people, you had multiple applications, you had multiple processes that had to share the machine, right? 
And so again, those two questions that, that are going to absorb us this semester started to arise, right? How do I do the, how do I partition the resources? Who do I give, you know, which processes do I give what? And then also, how do I enforce those partitions, right? How do I make sure that, that processes don't misbehave and, 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 uh, and interact with each other in, in, in not nice ways, right? So, so again, I mean, really, really operating systems were a response, right, to the fact that computers got fast enough and powerful enough that they could start to do multiple things at once, right? That there, was, there started to be enough resources on the machine that you could support multiple users, you could support multiple programs, and that's what gave birth to these sort of classic, you know, classic scheduling ideas, right? So, and, and one way of thinking about this, right, was that it, one of, the, one of the things that happened, right, was it used to be that computing time was very valuable, right? And human time was, was you know, in, in some sense less valuable, right? And in that sort of environment, what you do is you schedule the humans, right? So in general, what we try to do in operating system, we try to schedule the things that are, you know, that, that we try to, we try to, we try to, um, we try to prioritize the things that are valuable, right? So if the computer is valuable, then you just have the humans form a line outside, right? And you try to keep the computer going 24-7, right, by causing the humans to queue up and wait, right? And, and this is kind of how we did this, with this batch scheduling idea, right? Where people would come, there was no you know, interactive use, you would submit your job, you'd pick it up later, right? And, and this is batch scheduling. And again, batch scheduling still has some some nice features, right, that we will talk about when we get back to scheduling in a, in a lecture or two. So, but then, but then again, let's, let's talk about, so, you know, what, what is one of the problems with batch scheduling? So I have this idea of I'm going to devote all of the resources on the machine to a single job, right? And I'm going to run that job until it completes, right? And again, these were the types of jobs and the types of really computational type jobs that ran to completion, right? There was no interaction. It, you were computing something, right? Maybe like a missile trajectory or, you know, some, you know, uh, you know big, you know, uh, complicated uh, calculation that you were going to do and it was going to pop out a result and it was going to sit there running for a while, right? But we talked about the fact that the CPU far, and, and even on these early systems, right, this was still true, right? And things have gotten worse to some degree over time, right? But the CPU is still the fastest component of the system, right? So what's the problem with this sort of approach, right? So I take one job, I run it on the machine until it completes, right? I have whatever resources I have on the machine, I'm just going to let that job go until it's done. Gino. Right, at any given point, it doesn't need all the resources, right? At any given point in its execution, something is going to be the bottleneck. Right? And this is still true on your systems today, right? Something is the bottleneck for every process on your system at any given moment in time, right? Maybe it's the CPU, maybe it's memory bandwidth, maybe it's the network, maybe it's the speed of your disk, but something is the bottleneck. One component is holding it back, one component is determining the speed at which it is making forward progress, and the rest of the components are underutilized if they're not being shared, right? So if they're not being shared, there's one component out there that's holding you back, and all the other ones are saying, hey, I'm available, you know? Um, why, so here's an interesting question. The CPU is the fastest, you know, most expensive component of the system. If you're doing things like, you know, big, gonky calculations, why might it not be such a bad idea to batch schedule the system? Yeah, a bit. Yeah, I mean, to some degree, these, these early uh, jobs were probably really CPU bound, right? I mean, they were doing big calculations, right? Maybe they were memory bound too, right? Because they might have been reading big data sets, but they probably weren't, right? They were probably doing like, they, they probably took small inputs, right, and did a huge amount of computation and produced a small output, right? So for most of the time during their execution, they are CPU bound, and so, okay, maybe this isn't so terrible, right? But in general, as Gina pointed out, right, the you know, at any given point in time, some component on the system is the bottleneck, and the other components are underutilized, right? Okay. So the, the solution we came up to this, for this problem, right, is this idea of context switching, okay? And 
What context switching does is it allows us to, the, the goal of context switching, right? The, the goal of really um, everything, almost everything, and until we get to file systems, then the goals become a little bit different, right? But the goal of the CPU and memory abstractions and uh, multiplexing techniques we're going to talk about for the next few months is to take a single set of resources and partition them in a way that makes the sum of all these parts look way, way, way bigger than, than what's actually there, right? So it's this kind of clever magic trick. And if we can pull it off, we can make you know, one computer look like 18 computers or 52 computers, right? Every process looks like it has its own computer that is as fast and as powerful as the underlying machine, but in reality, all the processes are sharing the same machine, right? So again, it's this kind of, it's this pretty intense sort of uh, magic trick, you can think of it that way. We're trying to, to, to divide the resources so efficiently and so cleverly that applications don't even notice that they're sharing the machine, right? That, that's, that's, the, oh, that's the overall goal. And one of the, one of the main ways that we do that, or reasons that we do that, is these slow devices, right? We talked about memory, and memory isn't really our problem, right? But slow devices, frequently uh, disks for long periods of time, disks have just not gotten very fast, right? I mean, I, I wish I had this up on a slide, but if you look at the uh, spread between disk latencies and CPU latencies, it's, it's, it's been fierce, right? I mean, CPUs have been going off off up to the right, Moore's law, you know, now you know, we're spreading out a little bit on multiple cores, but we're still doing a really good job of making that component faster and faster and faster. Disks aren't getting that much faster, right? They've gotten a little bit faster, flash, you know, solid state disks have helped, but they're still, the, the, the CPU has still outstripped them and continues to do so at a, at a much, much greater rate. And we'll come back to this when we talk about file systems, because that explains the parts of file system design. Yeah, Remo. I mean, it would be great if they did, right? I mean, in theory, um, you know, and, and, and it's too bad, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, if everything, what, what typically tends to happen, right, I would argue, is that you can design, you can do a very good job of system design for a specific set of relationships between components, right? So early systems had a certain ratio that was established between the CPU and main memory. Right, or between the CPU and the disk. When those relationships change, then some of your design assumptions break down and the system doesn't work very well anymore. Right? So over time, as those relationships have changed, even if, like, if we came up with some technology, and it's possible, right? people are working on, you know, there are, there are, there's research going into essentially um, memory-like chips that save state. Right? So, Solid, I, don't know what, I can't remember what it's called, right? But it would essentially mean that your, your system would never have a disk again, right? Because it would have memory that was as fast as memory, but that was able to save its state like a disk, right? Yeah, something like that. I can't remember exactly what the name of the technology is called. But you can imagine how much that would change system design, right? If the contents of memory were persistent, right? I mean, it's, it's really actually kind of fun to think about all the changes that that would bring about, right? But what happened over time, again, is e even if those things changed, so even if tomorrow we came out with the technology like that, we would have to revisit the architecture of the way we build systems, right? Because all these relationships have changed, and some of the things we do now to hide these latencies, we wouldn't need to do anymore, right? And then there'd be new opportunities as well that would, that would emerge. Jeremy, did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, yeah, so it's like not, it's, the idea is the non-volatile RAM, right? But RAM is a memory that is as fast as RAM, but, but doesn't, doesn't lose state like RAM does when it's powered off. Um, so, so a lot of the goals of these early systems was trying to keep the processor active, right? Hide latencies by these slow devices and try to keep the processor busy, right? And that makes some degree of sense, right? Because the processor is really the component on the system where something is happening, right? Like the, if you think about it, the processor is the part of the system that changes things, right? The processor is involved with, well, you know, there's certain things that can bypass the processor if you have, you know, clever architectural tricks, but a lot of what happens on the system goes through the processor in some way, right? And so if the processor is busy, the assumption is the system is well, kind of well utilized, right? And that's not a perfect assumption, but it's not a bad one either, right? Um, so, okay, I don't know where I was trying to go with this. Let's just keep going. <laughs> 
So I'm trying to remember exactly what the point of this slide was. All right, I think you get the point. The point is that we have you know, multiple tasks on the system now, and those tasks can be distributed either between multiple users or between uh, on a single user. Right? I think I just did the slide because I wanted to have multiple icons of the, of the business-looking woman standing there. Um, OK, so again, now, now I have this idea that I'm, I'm, what I really want is this. Right? So this is the illusion I'm trying to take place. Let's say I have, I have two users on the system. right? And this is what this user is doing, and this is what this user is doing over time. But in reality, this is a single core system, right? And so there's only one thing that's going on at any point in time. So how, I mean, you, you guys know this from your earlier classes. How is this actually accomplished, right? How do I get the system to look like this, despite the fact that the reality is that there is only one thing that is happening at any given point in time? Yeah, Frank. Yeah, so remember these perceptual limits we talked about before? What I can do is I can exploit them to do this. So this is what's actually happening on your system, right? If you're using multiple applications or, or let's say, a, a better example here is usually like something long running in the background, like you're playing an MP3 or something, or you're listening to music, and you're also browsing on Firefox. What's, what is the system actually doing? It's rapidly switching between tasks so fast right, and so well that you don't notice. Right? Because again, I mean, you, you're limited in your perceptual abilities. And so if the processor sneaks away from running Firefox for you know, a couple million cycles in order to write some audio data to the buffer so that your song will continue to play smoothly, you don't notice that. Right? It's too fast for you. Right? So this, if you zoom out far enough, starts to blur into looking like both things are happening at the same time. Right? That's, that's the, that's the uh, goal here. Right? So in order to, uh, let's, let's, talk, let's just go through this before we get done today. So in order to perform a context switch, right? So a, a context switch here means that I'm going to stop Firefox. Firefox is running, right? Firefox is going about its business. It's you know, rendering some web page, and it thinks that it's the only process on the system, right? And that's, that's because I've allowed it to think that. And I'm going to be very careful to make sure that it keeps thinking that, OK? But suddenly, I realize that you know, my audio buffer is, is draining, or uh, the user is typing at the terminal, and I need to allow another process to run. Okay? So the first, thing, the first problem here right, is, how does the operating system get control in the first place? Remember, I said that Firefox is running. right? It's running on the CPU. It's going about its business. So what are ways that the operating system might get control? Jeremy, I'm going to ignore you. I'm going to ignore you, too. Yeah. Some kind of interrupt, right? So what, what could generate an interrupt? Tim. Oh, yeah, you picked the wrong one. I didn't want to start with that. Yeah. What's that? OK. What else? You had one, Okta? You guys with your timer interrupts. OK, fine. So, but there are, there are other things that could cause, even if, let's say, pretend I didn't have a timer. OK, what else could happen that would cause the operating system to take control? Yeah, Manish. Yeah. Well, that, OK, so a trap is what would cause this. But what would cause the trap? Right? What's something other than a timer that could happen that would be associated with Firefox that might cause me to? Yeah, like, for example, a network packet that Firefox had requested might have arrived. Right? So I might uh, get an interrupt for th that was generated by Firefox, right? saying that, hey, you know, uh, there's another packet here for the web page that you're trying to render. Right? Um, so, so it's not necessarily the case that I need a timer. right? Because there, or what else could Firefox do? Right? What could Firefox do that would cause me to take control? Jen. Firefox is running along happily, and then the operating system starts to run. It has an exception. It, OK, it could have an exception, in which case this, this might not keep going. right? So it might have done something, and it would crash. right? But let's say I wanted to keep running. right? Simon. Sorry, no doubt. Doesn't know. <laughs> 
What could it? Yeah, AJ. Yeah, which would generate what eventually? What kind of interrupt? A system call, right? Firefox could make a system call. Firefox could say, hey, I want to read something. I'm done rendering that packet. I want to read another packet from my network socket. So I'm going to make a read call. And the operating system would start running, right? But let's say that none of those things happen, right? Let's say that Firefox is like computing digits of pi or something, right? And it doesn't read anything from disk. It doesn't need the operating system's help. It's just doing something that's completely CPU bound. It is never going to receive an interrupt. It's never going to, there's, nev there's no hardware interrupt that's ever going to happen. It's never going to make a system call. This is a kind of a contrived example because that's very unlikely on modern systems. But what would I, so what would happen then? I don't have a timer. Let's pretend I don't have a timer. So <laughs> I, I know, everyone knows the answer to this question. So if I didn't have a timer, and Firefox never made a system call. And there was never anything ever that happened with hardware ever again, right? <laughs> what would happen? Spencer. Firefox would run a server. Firefox would just go, yeah, you guys are, you guys are team, you guys team up on me to learn your last names. Um, OK, Firefox would run forever, right? Uh, or until Firefox, on certain systems, Firefox might be, pr might be designed to periodically say, hey, you can run now. You know? So there are, there are systems that were built to do what's called cooperative multitasking, where Firefox might actually have to give up control of the CPU voluntarily. Right? But let's say I don't want that to happen. I'm the dictatorial operating system. I don't want Firefox to run together forever. So what do I need to do to take control? I need to set up some kind, right? So this was what we just talked about, right? It's possible that none of these things will happen. I need some kind of way to ensure that the operating system will always be able to run in a bounded amount of time, right? And the way I do this is very simple. I set up a timer, and those timer interrupts give the, the operating system a chance to run. And yes, in general, every time the timer on your system fires, the operating system will run. Every time. Sometimes it won't do much. Sometimes it'll just trap into the kernel. The kernel will look around, say, I don't need to do anything, and just let the interrupt complete and let the process that was running continue to run. Right? But every time the timer fires, and it fires a lot, right? you have this overhead of having to enter the kernel, save some state, look around, figure out what's happening, and then allow things to pr proceed. Do context switch generally happen in those like, timer Yeah, no, well, exactly. Right? So this is the. Um, this is the mechanism that allows me to do this, right? So even if these things weren't generating interrupts, even if they, you know, they, they weren't making system calls, I would always be able to time slice them this way if I want to, because I have some timer that fires fast enough that allows me to take control of the system at regular intervals, right? So frequently on many systems, the timer is one of the highest priority interrupts. Right? It can be masked in certain cases, but it usually isn't. And it's always firing. Right? So it is always going to make sure that these, the, um, the kernel will have, will have the chance to run. Right? So the last thing I'm going to leave you, yeah, Remo, go ahead. Too small. Yeah, so OK, well, OK, this is a, this is a good question. So, so let, me, let me do this, and then we'll come back to that. right? So this is kind of what I just want to leave you with today, and then on Wednesday we'll talk about how we do context switches. So, but this is an important thing to keep in mind as a programmer, and it's a particularly important thing to keep in mind um, during this class and any other time that, that you're using these types of systems. Because this creates a huge number of headaches for you guys right? as programmers, and it's something that you guys, but, it, but this is the real big thing in mind. If you write a user process, that user process can be stopped at any time. And an arbitrary amount of time can go by before it is started again. Dealing with this is really the subject of assignment one. And, and all sorts of uh, programmer effort and des language design and other things have gone into addressing this simple problem. Right? When you guys write your sequential programs in C or Java or whatever they are, Unless you arrange things otherwise, at any point in time, you know, in between two lines of code, sometimes in the middle of one line of code, your program can be stopped, 
an arbitrary amount of things can happen, and then your program will start to run. Right? This is something that's very difficult to think about as a programmer because you're, you're used to thinking sequentially. It's like, well, I put that value into that register and then I do this, and I run this calculation. That's not actually what happens. What happens is, again, in the middle of sometimes, and certainly in a, in a language like Java, right, in the middle of a line of code, things can stop. Anything, almost anything can happen to the system. Unless you take explicit steps to make sure that certain things stay the same, which we'll talk about, anything can happen, and then your process gets restarted, right? So I want to go back to Remo's question just, just to finish class. So would there be a case where I could have timer interrupts that would fire too rapidly? Right, you guys can start packing out. This is just a, an interesting question. So, um, so during the timer interrupt, one of the things that's going to happen, which we'll talk about on Wednesday, is I'm going to save the state of the thread that caused the interrupt. And then frequently, I'm going to run some code inside the operating system kernel that's going to try to figure out what to do next. Right? And what to do next might mean that I need to schedule a different thread to run. Right? So scheduling is the policy that goes along with Context switching is a mechanism for switching between the threads. Scheduling is figuring out which thread to run next. If the, so think about it this way. Every time there's a context switch, every time this timer fires, there's a fixed amount of work, at minimum, that the operating system will do. Right? As the interval gets smaller, right, that fixed amount of work starts to dominate the total amount of work that happens on the system. Right? So if I schedule like, you know, if I schedule twice as often, then the amount of time I spend in the context switch code doubles, right? So if I make the interval smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually I might be spending 50% of my time just context switching back and forth in, in and out of the kernel, right? And that would be kind of dumb, because the whole point of the system is not to run context switch code, right? The point of the system is to do the stuff in between when the kernel gets to choose threads, right? So there is a balance here. If I make the interval too short, then I basically am spending all my time scheduling and context switching. I don't do any useful work. What happens if I make it too long? What happens if I make the, let's say I made the context switch interval like one second. Yeah, now, I, now I'm way past my human perceptual limit of 100 milliseconds, right? So if my terminal's running and Firefox is sitting there trying to paint, right, then a second goes by and all of a sudden, boom. You know, that would actually be, kind of be fun to see what your system would feel like that way. It'd be like, boom. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd notice like the clock would go forward like very jerkily, you know, like every, it would be weird, right? So you have to be fast enough that you can get below those human perceptual limits, but you have to be slow enough that you don't overwhelm the system with context switching. So that's the balance. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Jeremy, yeah. Is the uh, interval that the, that the timer runs at, is that uh, hardwired in? <laughs>